I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Fuck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. And I'm supposed to tell you hello from four of my friends. Four of them? Mm Mm-hmm. They told me to tell you that they just love the Comic Weekly. Well, isn't that wonderful? What are their names? Well, they're three brothers and their sister. And their names are Susie and Jean and Lenny and Bert. Well, just for that, we'll have to read the funnies for them, especially today. So now here we'll read Puck the Comic Weekly in just a moment. But before we do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the top of the first page, Hopalong Cassidy. Oh, this is getting so exciting. Oh, you bet it is. So here we go with Hopalong Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hopalong. Hoppy, California, and Lucky have miraculously escaped from the outlaw's hideout when they set it afire. They're taking Felipe toward his father's hacienda, a Spanish word for home. Sloat and his henchmen have spotted them, and they've ridden into a town called Rio Vista and have told the sheriff there that Hoppy, California, and Lucky have kidnapped Philip. The sheriff sits forward in his chair and exclaims, You sure you saw Don Raymond's son being carted off by the three strangers? Sloat replies, That's right, sheriff. Me lit out with a poor boy soon as they saw us watching him. The sheriff grabs his gun and heads outside, saying, We round up a posse. I'm deputizing you gents to point out the kidnapper's trail. First picture, second row, Hoppy of California and Lucky are leading Felipe home. Felipe, who has lost his eyesight from being blinded by the sun, hears the sheriff's posse behind him, and he stops and says, Wait, hoofbeats coming this way, senores. California looks back and sees the posse approaching and exclaims, Hey, they're behind us. Sloat's men hanged if he hasn't brought a whole gang to run us down. Well, that's all Hoppy needs to hear. And in a second, Hoppy, leading Felipe's horse and his pals, are burning leather. First picture bottom row, they come to a bend in the road. Hoppy sees a path leading through the trees, and he yells back to California. We're splitting up. You and Lucky lead him astray. I'll try and get Felipe out of this. Hoppy, leading Felipe, gallops off into the underbrush beside the road. There, they dismount and hide in the bushes and wait for the posse to pass. As soon as the posse goes by, Hoppy and Felipe mount again and then head off down the path which leads to another road. Hoppy says, they'll be doubling back once they discover we've tricked them. Let's clear out. They come out of the trees and seeing a wall ahead of them, last picture, Hoppy exclaims, ah, we're in luck. We'll be safe till night behind this wall. What Hoppy doesn't know, though, is that behind the wall stands a Mexican rancher, gun in hand, waiting for Hoppy to gallop through the gate. Oh, my. That was a smart trick of Hoppy's to save Felipe, but here he's riding right into another trap, isn't he? It certainly looks that way. I wonder who that Mexican rancher with the gun is. Well, next week we'll find out, I'm sure. Oh, this is really an exciting adventure. Huh? Huh? Now shall we read Prince Valiant? Oh, yes, please. And I'm sure he must be on page three again this week, isn't he? Well, turn over the page and let's... Yes, here he is on page three. Yes. Remember, uh, Val went to the top of the mountain to hunt for the chamois so he could get warm furs for the monks in the monastery. And just as he was starting off for home, loaded down with the furs, an arrow whizzed through the air and landed at his feet. And when Val looked up, he saw a lot of wild-looking men below in the valley. Well, let's find out more about this. So here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. (laughs) 
Lance Valiant looks at his late attacker, at the position of the sun, the surrounding rocks, then at the still quivering arrow at his feet, and the group of men swarming up the valley. He strings his bow, and last picture top row with the advantage of shooting downhill, Val sends an arrow whistling toward them. A second later, they respond with a volley of arrows, but the distance is too great for accuracy. But at the price of three arrows, Val collects 24, and first picture next row, as his opponents still fire at him, Val quickly picks up the arrows and stuffs them in his quiver. And now, well supplied with ammunition, he loads the skins on his shoulders again and leaves the valley. He starts diagonally up the ridge, climbing over the rocks. The valley falls away below him. And the barbarians try to head Val off as he passes above them, clinging to the narrow ledge and the rock wall, last picture, second row. But the steep sides of the valley and the soft snow hinder their climb, and they can't get to Val hard as they try for his picture bottom row. Who knows what these squat men are? One of the wandering tribes, perhaps, from the distant steppes, forced ever westward by the pressure of more savage tribes to descend like birds of prey on hapless Europe. Val, up above, last picture, is finding the way has become steeper, and the melting snow makes the rock ledge more perilous. There's no place to rest. Val must go on. And a new enemy confronts him. Behind him are the savages. And below is a drop of a hundred feet if he makes one single misstep. And night is coming on. Oh, my, the chances Val takes. Yes, he's in a dangerous spot having to spend the night on a thin ledge on the mountainside. He certainly is, but I'm glad he has those warm furs with him. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now, how would you like to read Uncle Remus? Oh, I'd love to read Uncle Remus, because he's my favorite favorite. Well, then, let's turn over the page and go past little iodine and Snuffy Smith, then turn over another page. There, in the middle of page seven, is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity-hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, When Br'er Rabbit was teaching school, the young uns was getting good notions. Yes, Br'er Rabbit is teaching school to some of his little rabbit friends, and he's drawn a picture on the blackboard of Br'er Fox and a rabbit. He's worked out an arithmetic problem, which says that one fox plus one rabbit equals no rabbit. This means a fox would eat the rabbit up because the fox is bigger than the rabbit. Below that, he's drawn another picture of a fox plus five rabbits equals no fox. And Br'er Rabbit says, Just remember, Br'er Fox ain't never passing up no lonesome rabbit. In unity, there is strength. That's all for today, chillins. And all the little rabbits dash out of school on their way home. When they get outside, one rabbit says, Hurry up, hurry up, I know what it is. And down the road they go following the leader. A little later, we're out on the edge of a high cliff beside an old hollow log. And the leader of the little rabbits has taken a firecracker out of the log and is about to light it. All the other little rabbits are lined up, leading from the log back to the edge of the cliff. And the leader rabbit says, Everybody ready? And his friend replies, Yep, everybody in place. Here it comes. And the leader touches a match to the fuse. The fuse starts to burn. And quickly, last picture, top row, the rabbits hand the firecracker from one to another until it gets to the last one at the edge of the cliff. First picture, bottom row. And that little rabbit tosses the firecracker over the cliff, and it heads straight for Br'er Fox, who is sound asleep at the foot of the cliff. And a second later, there is a... And last picture, Br'er Fox, his clothes blown all to tatters, holds his aching head and moans, ooh, ooh, Where in the world did that come from, boo? And Uncle Remus says, Club together. And you get unity. Individually, you get clubbed. <laughs> well, those little rabbits certainly learned their lesson well, didn't they? <laughs> I should say so. If you're a little fellow and you're up against a big fellow, the big fellow's apt to get you. But if you're little and you stick together with a lot of other little friends... The big fellow's going to leave you alone. Yes, that's very good, because I don't like bullies. No, neither do I. And now I believe it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. Very well, here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. <coughs> Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <coughs> There's 
a knock at the door. Blondie answers it, and a workman says, We're repairing the water main. We have to turn up the water for the whole street for two hours. When Blondie tells Dagwood they won't have any water in the house for two hours, he exclaims, But I was going to take a bath. Blondie replies, Well, hurry up and fill the tub before they shut off the water. So Dagwood dashes up to the bathroom <laughs> and runs water in the tub. And he exclaims, Hooray! I got the tub filled just before they turned it off. First picture, next row. Dagwood's in the tub, enjoying his hot bath. And he says contentedly, My nerves have been on the ragged edge. This sizzling hot bath is just what I need to soothe them. Suddenly, the bathroom door opens. Cookie and her pals come in, each of them carrying a little pan. Cookie says, May I have a little water, Daddy? We're making mud pie. And they scoop water out of the tub. Then out of the door they go, leaving Dagwood looking a little surprised. He settles down in the tub again. Suddenly, the door opens again. The dogs come running in and jump up on the edge of the tub and begin to lap it up greedily. Blondie says, The pups are terribly thirsty, dear. Can they have a few sips? The dogs finish with their drinks and trot out of the bathroom with contented looks on their faces. Leaving Dagwood looking quite disturbed. First picture next row, Blondie quickly dashes in, dips a pail in the tub and says, And uh, I'll just need a bucket full to finish mopping up the kitchen. And walks out of the bathroom with a smile on her face. Thanks, Dagwood. Leaving Dagwood looking very angry. A moment later, a neighbor lady rings Blondie's doorbell. Blondie opens the door, and the neighbor lady asks, Have you some spare water to spare, Blondie? I just started my laundry when they turned it off. Blondie looks upstairs, and then... <laughs> Last picture of the row, all the women in the neighborhood are running toward the Bumstead house, carrying pots and pans, because they've heard there's water in Dagwood's bathtub. First picture, bottom row, they're all upstairs in the bathroom, dipping water out of Bag- Dagwood's bathtub, as one lady says, Well, what became of Mr. Bumstead? He doesn't seem to be in the tub. <laughs> Dagwood is hanging outside the window from the sill without any clothes on. Oh, except the bath towel around his waist. And Blondie sticks her head out and says to him, Okay, dear, you can come back in again. The ladies have all gone, and they thank you. Dagwood climbs through the window mournfully. At last picture, we see him sitting in the bathtub, but you can't see any water. And as he sits there, hating people, a little boy comes in and says, May I feel my water pistol, Mr. Bumstead? No, there wouldn't be any left for me! (laughs) (laughs) That's the funniest thing you ever saw. (laughs) Dagwood sitting in the bathtub without any water in it. (laughs) Yes, poor Dagwood. Everyone takes advantage of him. (laughs) Yes, and he was the only one who had sense enough to run water in the tub. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, it's Roy Rogers. This is a very exciting adventure. Well, I'll read Roy Rogers in just a moment. But before I do, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Oh, I'm anxious to find out if Roy is well again today because you remember last week when he went into the blacksmith shop that uh, convict that had escaped from Roy had jumped on Roy and knocked him out. And then he closed the door to the blacksmith shop and set fire to the hay inside and was going to leave Roy to burn to death. But then Trigger kicked open the door and pulled Roy out with his teeth. Well, now let's find out what happens with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. hi yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi <laughs> Jay Lucian Dangerfield, Roy's friend, has really put Roy in the spot. In order to get publicity in the newspaper about his Wild West show, he had told the newspaper man that Roy Rogers would deliver the escaped convict Handles Baldwin to the sheriff right in the ring of the show. Now, this is something Roy didn't know about. Today's the day of the big show, and Dangerfield is out front announcing. Step up, folks. Behold the world's most stupendous show. See Roy Rogers in the center arena. 
Roy, who has recovered from the blow on his head given him by Baldwin, rides up and says, Hey, hold everything, Dangerfield. What's the idea of this crazy story? You plumb local? And he shows Dangerfield the front page of the Saddle Butte newspaper, which has big headlines reading, Roy Rogers promises to deliver escaped convict to sheriff at Wild West Show today. Dangerfield says proudly, Yes, <clears throat> a sensational publisher, Stante. What, Roy? Oh, look at this crowd. Roy replies, a fine pickle you got, I see, and I don't even know where Baldwin is. But I do know that he's gunning for us both. Dangerfield exclaims, uh, Roy, you think that handle Ian Ruffian is here? Roy grabs him by the arm and heads him toward the inside of the arena, saying, you get into that arena and tell the crowd that story is something you dreamed up. Dangerfield protests, Oh, but my bosom friend, you can't do this to me. They'll want their money back. Oh, no, 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 Roy. Please, no, no. Last picture, top row. Handles Baldwin, who is disguised as a cowboy, sees Roy and Dangerfield walking toward the arena. And Baldwin says to himself, I'll fix that bragging Rogers so that all he'll turn into the sheriff today is himself on a slab. First picture, bottom row. Dangerfield is stopped beside a pen holding a huge bull, and he says... Why, Roy, I've even imported the pampas killer, the world's most ferocious bull. I'll go bankrupt if the crowd demands his money back. Roy, have pity. Roy replies, get going. You should have thought of that before, planting that false story in the newspaper. As Roy leads Dangerfield toward the gate, into the ring, Baldwin slips around to the pen, saying, So you're the pampas killer, huh? Well, I'm going to let you show how bloodthirsty you really are. Go get Rogers. And he opens the pen, freeing the bull. The bull trots out, sees Dangerfield and Roy walking into the arena, and he lets out a bellow, then gallops toward them. Somebody in the crowd yells, Hey, look out! The wild bull's loose! Roy turns around last picture, sees the bull coming toward him, and exclaims, Run, Dangerfield! I gotta stop him before he hurts somebody! He certainly is, and heading straight for Roy. I wonder what Roy will do to stop him. It looks like the crowd will see something they didn't expect. That handles Baldwin. I just hope that Roy scares the bull out of the ring and right for handles Baldwin. Well, next week we'll find out more about that. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, it's Flash Gordon. And uh, you remember, he defeated the mean wizards, and, and he was very kind to Queen Suni. Oh, he was. He destroyed the magic ray machine by which the wizard had kept everybody slaves on the planet. And he showed Queen Suni's people how to build modern machinery. And then he began to build a rocket ship, too. Queen Suni said that he could. That's right. So he'd be able to get home again. Let's see what's happening now. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rega rega doon doon Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash finishes his space rocket and bids his friends farewell. He tells Dale, We'll head for Earth. It's a long trip in an untested ship, but I promised I'd take you home at last. Last picture, everything is in readiness for Flash's departure. He and Dale settle down in the cockpit of their new rocket ship. And... Flash's ship blasts itself free from the small planet's gravity and drops its used-up takeoff rockets. And last picture, top row... Flashes off on the long, curving course toward Mother Earth, which he and Dale haven't seen for years. First picture, bottom row, Flash is looking through his telescopic navigation glasses. It's much later. He pauses in his star navigation and looks at Dale with quiet triumph and says, That's it, Dale. There's our Earth. And it makes Dale so happy, she begins to cry. She can't even see it, much as she wants to. As they near the Earth, Flash reaches for the rocket controls and says tensely, Fasten your belt. A meteor's crossing our path. Gravity's pulling us together. I've got to change course fast. This is a tense moment, as the meteor, which is a shooting star, falls swiftly toward them, a fiery blaze. Straight toward them it roars. Desperately, Flash pulls at the steering lever, and not a second too soon, he dodges the meteor, which falls past them toward Earth. Last picture. But all Flash's landing plans are ruined. He's plunging into the stratosphere at a speed that will quickly turn the rocket into a white-hot shooting star. Does that mean he's not?
not going to be able to land on Earth? I'm afraid not. You see, when he had to change his course quickly, the atmospheric pressure sucked him out into the stratosphere, a layer of air outside the gravity pull of Earth. You mean something just pulled him away out into that other air? That's right, and I'm afraid it's pulled him so swiftly he can't slow his rocket ship down. Well, where will he land? Hmm, that's something we'll find out next week. Oh, that's really exciting. I can't wait to hear about that. Oh, and neither can I. Well, now... Oh, oh, now is the time for Dick's adventures? I'm very anxious to read what's going to happen to Dick. Well, Dick had brought General Lafayette and Baron de Kalb to help General Washington in his fight against the British, remember? And, uh, yes, and just as the British were about to attack, uh, George Washington led his army to a place outside the town of Philadelphia. Yes, a spot called Brandywine Creek, and there they dug in, waiting for the British attack, which is expected any minute. Read quick. Very well. Here we go with Dick's adventures, and say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have, have music, music for Adventurous Dick. Dick dreams he's with Mad Anthony Wayne in Pennsylvania. Mad Anthony Wayne, one of the most famous generals of the Revolutionary War, fighting at a place called Chad's Ford on Brandywine Creek in Pennsylvania. Last picture top row, the British seem to be preparing to smash through at Chad's Ford. But it's only a feint, because instead, Dick sees, first picture second row, a mighty British force led by Cornwallis. He cleverly marches up the Brandywine, crosses it unseen, and makes a surprise reappearance behind the American line. Dick is dismayed when he sees the British Army coming at them from behind, but then at the same instant, last picture of the row that the Redcoats attack from behind, their battalions on the opposite bank, waiting this signal, start swarming across in an overwhelming rush. The Americans are caught between two walls of British forces that are closing in on them, and the battle rages furiously. It becomes a hand-to-hand combat. The Americans are outnumbered in men, guns, and ammunition. And in this instant of real panic, Dick and the men around him, first picture, bottom row, hear Anthony Wayne yelling above the roar of muskets and cannon. Fight, boys! Fight! Wayne himself is fighting like a madman. He and his men hold off the British while Washington's army manages to get away and regroup for a battle at a later date. Retreat of Washington's men covered, Wayne and his battle-wearied boys see that the army is safe and that darkness has fallen. They slip off into the fog and darkness and safety for themselves, leaving the British to wonder what happened to the army they thought they had in their clutches. You mean that mad Anthony Wayne's soldiers, uh, they fought the British and kept the British fighting them so that Washington's soldiers could get away? That's exactly what happened. Until darkness, and then under cover of the dark, they all slipped away. And it seemed to the British that the whole American army had disappeared. But the Americans lost that battle, didn't they? Yes, they did. Sometimes you have to lose battles to save your army for another battle. Oh, then then it isn't really so terribly bad, is it? Well, like so many things. You know, you have to have some disappointments today so that you can make things come out right in the end. Oh, you mean like saving your money for a bicycle. You have to give up the little things today. Oh, you understand perfectly. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, now... Oh, now, now I know it's time for Rusty Riley. And you know how I know? How? Well, because here he is right below Dick's adventure. Well, why didn't I get that? <laughs> Remember, Rusty had bought the painting of the horse for only 50 cents in that old shop. And that was the cause of some trouble, because a young man named Smith in a nearby town learned that his landlady had sold the picture from his room. And he became very unhappy about it. And he's gone in search of the picture. He's learned that someone at the Miles Farm bought the picture. And so he's bought an airplane ticket to Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, just about this time, Mr. Miles told Rusty and Tex that they were going to go home to Kentucky in the truck. Yes. Well, now let's find out what happens next in this mystery. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. (laughs) Rusty comes in to Mr. Miles and says... Oh, I've got big blaze in the horse man, Mr. Miles, and all the luggies, too. Tex and I are ready to leave. Well, okay, Rusty, I'll go out with you. I uh, want Tex to do something for me on the way. So Mr. Miles goes outside with Rusty to the truck where big blaze is loaded. Tex and Rusty are all packed, ready to head for their home in Lexington, Kentucky. Mr. Miles hands Tex some money, saying, Oh, uh, Tex, there's a shortcut to the new highway that goes right by the airport. 
I uh, want you to stop and reserve seats for Patty and me and flight number six to Lexington. Dex replies, Sure, boss. Meanwhile, at the boarding house in town, the young man named Mr. Smith is saying to his landlady, Oh, Mrs. Clancy, I'll be gone for a few days, maybe a week. Uh, hold my room. Now I gotta hurry. She reminds him of his job at the airplane factory and asks him if he quit. He answers, uh, uh, well, no time to explain now. Goodbye. Last picture top row, Mr. Smith is at the ticket office at the air terminal saying, Reservation to Lexington, please. Uh, the name is Smith. The ticket is handed to him and he steps aside. First picture bottom row, Tech steps up to buy the ticket for Mr. Miles. And Mr. Smith overhears Tech saying, Oh, well, um... I want to make two reservations, miss, on flight number six to Lexington, Kentucky, to be called for by Quentin Miles of the Milestone Farm. Smith says to himself, Milestone Farm? The people who have my horse painting. That must be the big Texan the antique dealer described. And as Tex walks out of the terminal, Smith follows him, saying, I'll just keep that old cowboy in sight until the plane's ready. Maybe he and the kid who has my picture aren't going to Lexington. He follows Tex outside and sees him walking toward the truck and says... By George, they are going to Lexington, but they're going in that horse van. He hears Tex say to Rusty, Okay, Rusty, we can start rolling for the home corral. When Smith hears this, he says, I can wrangle a ride with him. Maybe I can get back that picture on the way. He walks over to the van and says, Oh, pardon me. I see you're from Lexington. If you're heading that way, I could use a lift. Uh, I can help you drive. Tex looks at him and replies, well, now, friend, uh, we got a valuable horse on board. I'd have to know a little about you. Ooh, wouldn't it be awful if Tex were to let him ride in that truck? Oh, that would really be an unusual situation. My, I can't wait till next week to find out if Tex does. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to, and not only that, that's all the time I have now. But before I go... Here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tonic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and hotties. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.